Hey guys, my name's Max Convexty. Thanks for tuning into my channel. I got a great video planned out for you today. It's on the new Defiance Fund, TRES. It's a fund that's based on treasury, similar to a couple of other funds. We're going to talk about all that. We're going to read the prospectus. Then at the end of the video, I'm going to get kind of deep into the specific option trading strategy these guys are using to hopefully make this money. That might be a little bit involved, and that's why I put it at the end of the video, in case you just want to watch the first of the video and then tune out. That's fine with me also. It is a gorgeous day, and I'm getting ready to take Jackson to the dog park, and it's steak night at the Max Convexity house tonight. We're going to cook some Wagyu beef right out here on this grill. So let's get right into the middle of this thing. So TRES, their first day of trading was last Thursday. They only have two and a half million dollars under management right now. The expense ratio is kind of high, 75 basis points, whereas the competition, which would be THTA, charges about a third less, 49 basis points. TLTW charges about half as much expense ratio at 35 basis points, a little less than half as much. All right, the too long don't read is this is a pure income fund. Nowhere in the prospectus does it mention that secondarily it is going to capture capital appreciation or it's going to look for growth. All those other funds, well, all the other defiance funds, let's just talk about them right now. The other defiance funds are income funds primarily, but then in the prospectus it also mentions they will also attempt to capture some capital appreciation. This one doesn't make that promise anywhere in there. The first sentence of the the first sentence of the prospectus said the Defiance Treasury Alternative Yield ETF seeks current income, period. So it's that's different. I'm not saying it's bad or, or good or it's just it's just definitely different. This fund is an actively managed exchange traded fund that seeks to cur generate current income by investing in treasuries. Of course, they all do that. Um, and these are one year treasuries. But then it says, and employing defined risk option strategies. We're going to get into defined risk in a second. They also say these strategies include credit spreads, debit spreads, long calls, and long puts. To implement these strategies, the fund will purchase and sell option contracts on selected exchange-traded treasury funds. Um, and those are going to be, that's going to be TLT. That's, that's the big daddy in exchange. That's the spy of, of treasury ETFs. So that's what they're going to use. They don't limit themselves to that, but that's what it means when they, when they say that. All right, so the too long don't read is this fund will also buy options. They aren't strictly a short vol fund. And what does short vol mean? Uh, triple QI is short vol. All the yield max are short vol. That means those investments want a steady market. And once they put on their, once they sell, in yield max's case, once they sell the call, or in Defiance's case, once they sell the put, they profit from volatility going down, from the volatility of the market going down. That's that's how they profit. There's Funds can either be put into a, a bucket of short vol or long vol. A long vol fund would be UVXY or TQQQ, which is a triple leveraged um, you know, QQQ fund, or SQQQ, which is an inverse triple leveraged fund. Those are long vol funds. They profit off volatility going up. They profit off chaos. They profit off unexpected things happening. The, the, the funds, the Defiance funds, IWMY, QQQY, JEPY, and also all of the yield max stuff right now, profits on things being stable. And, and they make a profit when volatility goes down, when, when the dip is bought. So it's a totally different strategy. This fund is not a long vol fund by any means. It does have, it does, they do leave themselves open with 50% of the portfolio anyway, to make some long volatility bets. So just right off the bat, the too long don't read is this fund is more aggressive than either THTA or TLTW. 
and and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Both THTA, TLTW, all the current defiance funds, and all the yield max funds are are their the option bets they make, the option strategy they use is a plus EV strategy. That means plus expected value. Those that means because they sell options, they have a mathematical edge in them. This fund doesn't just sell options, they buy options. When you buy options, you give up that ex that plus EV, that the plus positive expected value. You all of a sudden your negative expected value. And they've only done that on half the portfolio. So listen to this. For option contract holdings, the fund may invest 100% of its net assets into a combination of op option strategies. 0 to 50% in debit spreads, calendar spreads, diagonal spreads, and or puts or calls. Those are negative EV bets. Those are also long volatility bets in profit when the volatility goes up after you put the position on. That's not the only way they profit, but they do have a long volatility element to them. But then they also say that they can invest up to 80% in credit spreads. So they can only invest half of the portfolio, up to 50% in long volatility strategies. If they have on short volatility strategies, they can invest up to 80%. So I'm not saying they're doing anything unsafe. I'm just saying this is different. I get the question all the time in my comments you know, about QQQI. Well, if they see the market's going to go down, why can't they just buy some puts or do something defensive? And I just always say it's just not in their plan or whatever. Okay. In this, in this uh, fund, it is in their plan to be defensive in some cases. Listen to this. Long put option strategy overview. The fund may adopt a long put option strategy, particularly when Zega anticipates a decline in the price of the Treasury ETFs, a bearish outlook. Then it says the same thing or the opposite thing for the long call strategy. It says when Zega foresees an increase in Treasury ETF price, they can put on a bullish trade and they can just be long options. All right. They can also be long debit spreads, which are slightly safer than just being long an option, but you're still net long options. They can also use calendar and diagonal spreads, which are also safer than just being long a single option because you're long one option and short another, but you're still net long. So it would the calendar spreads, the debit spreads, and the long put and long call where they just buy a put or a call goes into that 50% basket. But then in the 80% basket, they can also do credit spreads. And credit spreads is where you buy an option and you sell another, but you're net short because the option you sell is more expensive than the one you buy. That's why it's a credit spread. When you put the trade on, you get a credit. This would be more similar to the strategy that uh, the current defiance funds do, and this would be a shortfall strategy. Vertical credit spreads. In this strategy, the fund earns an initial income, a net credit, because selling the option, because it sells an option at a higher premium and it simultaneously buys another option at a lower premium. The option sold is nearer to the strike price, closer to at the money, whereas the option bought is further out of the money. Typically, Zega resorts to credit spreads when it anticipates minimal movement in treasuries. ETF price when minimal movement in treasury ETF prices either stable or slightly fluctuating. This strategy leans towards a neutral stance with a hint of bullish or bearish potential. So these guys have left themselves open to do some pretty interesting trades and the one they have on right now which I'm going to talk about at the end of the video is a pretty interesting trade. It, that's why I got excited about this video when I decided to make it on Friday night when I saw what kind of trade they were doing. They do say defined risk in here a lot. And defined risk is, is good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is that you're still trading with an advantage like you are when you're trading, when you're doing the QQQY strategy, which is where you just sell a put. That is a that strategy is a plus expected value strategy or a short vol strategy. That strategy has a mathematical edge. They're talking about defined risk and it's kind of jargon. Yeah, it's good, but also a lot of their defined risk trades, they aren't trading with an advantage. So this fund right here, 
at least with 50% of their holdings, does leave themselves up to a little uh, decay or erosion from a strategic standpoint. The reason I'm so adamant about there's no erosion in the, in the other defiance funds or the yield max funds, I'm talking no erosion from a strategic standpoint. They're, the strategies they employ won't cause erosion, unlike UVXY, TQQQ, SQQQ, CYA, TAIL, unlike those strategies that buy options that do have erosion in them. From a strategic standpoint, the defiance funds and the yield max won't erode because they're selling options. They're in a plus EV situation. They have a they expect to win more often than they lose. Now it doesn't mean they always will win, or it doesn't mean they can't lose, and it also doesn't mean the price of whatever they're trading can't go down. That's not erosion or decay, that's just the price going down. These guys have left themselves open to a little bit of erosion or decay, because with half their portfolio, they can be net long on options. I think that's cool, though, too, because they're going to be able to be more defensive. If, if you put this fund on a spectrum with the other treasury ETFs, the most conservative treasury ETF would be THTA. The next, right in the middle, would be TLTW. And then the least conservative would be this fund, because they've left themselves open to do some, some just option buying. Okay, so Jay and the usual suspects are managing this. Jay's also subvising the competition over at THTA. We just have a very short history to work with with TLTW and THTA. THTA has only been around for about two months. But in those two months, you can already see that TLTW is going to get way more of the upside, but also way more of the downside. THTA strategy can be thought of as hitting singles if it was baseball or even bunting. They're taking the easy low-hanging fruit, but they, there isn't a lot of reward in the kind of trades they make. TLTW is making the same kind of trades that Yieldmax does. This is a covered call fund. They sell out-of-the-money covered calls on the TLT, the, the uh, Treasury Bond ETF. Here's a profit box that I made for TLTW. This month, they have the 97 bonds sold. So 97, or 97 options sold. So 97 would be where the max profit is. And that's why the top of the box is there. But anywhere in this green zone would give them a range of profits. But that's a more aggressive strategy than the THTA strategy. The THTA strategy s sells deep out of the money puts and deep out of the money calls and is a non-directional type strategy. It just makes a little bit of money off the, off the general decay in the options. So I would say THTA is the safest strategy. TLTW is, the, is in the middle and this new fund is going to be the most aggressive of the three. What that also means though is this fund will have the potential to pay a higher dividend than either TLTW or THTA. THTA hitting for singles and using the deep out of the money options and earning the time decay of those options, super safe, but they also don't earn that much. That's the trade-off. That's why if you look here, THTA has paid a 29 cent dividend so far. I looked at their dividend it's really young, but I think this fund might pay six to nine percent, something like that, five to eight percent, somewhere in that range, depending on conditions. TLTW pays about twice that. They're and they also aren't too old of a fund, but they're more in the sixteen to twenty percent range with their cover call strategy. Now, like I say, with just by looking at the strategy alone. I think the strategies they use will have the potential to pay more, maybe in the 20s percent, 20 20, 25 percent, something like that. But it's really an open-ended question because a lot of it depends on how effective they are at calling the market. These other funds like Triple QI and stuff, I always tell people these are not for market timing. These aren't market timing funds. They don't engage in any of that. There is just a scheme to collect extrinsic premium, which is what happens when you sell options. It's what makes options so profitable. 
this fund with at least 50% of it is going to do some outright speculating on direction. So if that goes right, this fund could actually probably pay a lot more than 20% dividend, but that can also go wrong. So a lot of it depends on, on how effective they are at managing the fund. The tracking error on this new fund, TRES, ought to be really fun to cover because they are going to actually make some get you know make some bold predictions. The other funds don't make do anything bold. They just mechanically collect that extrinsic premium. So what actually is TRES doing then? We've already talked about what the competition is doing. So this is a spreadsheet. This is actually their holdings right now at this time, at this point in time. Then I added a couple of rows to track it every day. You guys are going to start seeing this spreadsheet in my daily update. In fact, it was in my noon update. No one probably understood it, but, but it was in there. So this shows you right now these guys have uh, four options on. Right, and they're right here. We're going to talk about those in a second. I'm going to show you the profit and loss graph. But what the spreadsheet will reflect is every day that passes, it will update the price of the options and show you if the position is making or losing money. As of Friday, they had already lost nine cents. And as of today, they're only losing six cents. Now, these aren't daily options, so they haven't closed them yet. These options actually don't expire till the 23rd of February. And this is actually called a calendar spread. They've actually sold options that expired the 23rd of February, but then they bought options that expire later. Um, I believe they're, or I take that back, the options they sold expire the 9th of February. The options they bought expire the 23rd of February. So this is a calendar spread, and it's a double calendar spread, or it's also called a double diagonal. But what, the, what you're doing when you're making a play like this is you're banking on the options that expire on the 9th. Those are the ones you sold to decay at a faster rate than the options you bought that don't expire till the 23rd. And that's a pretty safe bet because one thing we know about options is the closer you get to, to expiration, the decay speeds up. So these managers are trying to make a bet on, on that. So it's a very, uh, very safe bet, and it's a good way to play for option decay and a good way to earn an income. These guys did a little twist, though, and that's uh, this is the interesting part, and I like this. I like what they've done here. If you look here, it would be a calendar or diagonal spread if it was the same amount of short options as long options. Well, they actually have twice as many long options as short options. So this makes this spread a ratio calendar spread, which is a cool trade. I've done it before. I like to do it on earn, on stocks that have earnings. I had a really big trade once on Lululemon on a ratio calendar spread, this same exact thing. And when I saw that they were using this strategy, I, you know, it got me really interested. I don't think they're going to use this strategy all the time. I just think it's the strategy they have on right now. They left themselves open to use a variety of different strategies. Here's what a diagonal spread looks like. It's where you short the near-term option. In this case, this is shorting an option that expires February 2nd, and then buying an option that expires uh, February 7th. The play is that the short option will decay at a faster rate than the long option. If you do the same thing at the same time with puts, then it becomes, with puts that are at a different strike price, then it becomes a double diagonal. Okay, so you can see the profit loss graph on this. This is a great way to make money off the market going nowhere. Similar to an iron condor or lots of other trades. You hope for a stable market. It can move a little, you can move, you know, up and down a little bit but you don't want an outlier move. You don't want a big up move or a big down move when you make this do double diagonal trade, right? Okay, that's great. What Jay and these guys did, though, is they, they did a double diagonal ratio where they bought the further out options twice, twice as much. So what that trade does is it still has a little bit of profit in the middle. It's the way a double diagonal works. But if you do happen to get an outlier, a big move, a 5 or 10% move up, you're covered. Not only are you covered, you profit. 
So uh, a, a double diagonal ratio spread is actually a long volatility strategy. What else it is, it's, it can also be thought of as being long on, uh, well, it's, it's a long volatility strategy, but it's also long on Vega. Vega is the Greek that represents in the option calculations, represents volatility. You, so it's long IV. In other words, watch this. I'm going to drag the IV. It's currently at 18.7% on TLT. If I drag the volatility up to like 22%, you can see it makes the trade more profitable. The higher volatility goes, in fact, the volatility goes high enough, it makes it where the trade can't lose. So they are, this, this trade is betting on a stable market, but at the same time, it's all right if the market's not stable. It's kind of a threading the needle trade. That's why I said I like to do it on earnings, and I did it on Lululemon once and several other stocks and had, had great outcomes. In an earnings stock, what happens is if the earnings are this week, the volatility for this week's options, because of the earnings and all the uncertainty around it, will be highly elevated. And then, especially compared to the next week out. So in the Lululemon case, I did this and, and it worked out great. Lululemon had like a 10% move after hours, after the market closed. In the, you know, and so I, I cleaned up on that trade. I don't think that's what Jay and them are trying to do. They aren't going for an outlier move. But when they have this position on, if an outlier move happens, they, they will profit. They will definitely profit. Now let's look. I'm going to show you the actual position Jay and them have on. I, I put in the fill prices they've used. They did this on Thursday. So this is a this is short 325 close to the money calls, the 93 calls, which is close to the money, at least when they put the trade on. But then they bought the 94 call for two weeks further in the future. Then at the same time, they sold the 93 put 325 times, but then bought 650, twice as many, the 92 put. So you can see what they've done. They've created a profit and loss graph where if an outlier move happened, it would be great. But they've also created what's called a valley of death. And the valley of death is if the market doesn't go anywhere, they, they will lose money. And that's because they are net sellers or they're net buyers of options. When you're a net buyer of options and the market goes nowhere, you're, you're going to lose money. Like I said, I don't, I'm not worried about this strategy or this uh, ETF. I don't think they'll do this all the time. But I think what, they're, what we know that they're thinking, they're thinking that maybe volatility is going to increase. Because if you do get a bump in implied volatility, look at that. If... Uh, then it makes it where the trade can't lose. It, it makes your valley of death disappear. By the same token, if the managers put this trade on and then volatility collapses while this trade's on, it increases the size of the valley of death. So this is a volatility um, spread or a volatility strategy. There's, and there's certain times in the earning stocks where you can also make money on a, a move if it goes nowhere because the on the, in the earning stock example, the um, the near term options are just so elevated as they as those decay, they will decay at like a much faster rate than the out of the money options. That you can set up trades on earnings where you can win in all three circumstances, and you can minimize your your valley of death to to some degree. In my option basics course, I plan to I plan to show you guys those trades, but this is probably the most this is the most advanced trade in my uh, tool bag, for sure. There's no, there's no doubt about it. And it's going to be probably several weeks in the future in the basic options course, because it's not very basic. So this is just what they, Jay and them have done this week. So I don't know if they're expecting an outlier move in TLT, if they're expecting it to go way up or way down, or if they're just expecting volatility to increase a little bit. Now we can see that it's. I had an update on this the other day. It's not only Jay and them. All right. So on Wednesday, we saw we actually saw an elevation in volatility, and these guys put this trade in on, on Thursday. So maybe these guys saw the same thing. Volatility was going down right here as the market's going up, and that's the usual condition. But then at the very top, even when the market was still going up, volatility started to tick up down here. 
So that's the pros. Generally, that's indicative of the pros or somebody buying protection. And so then Jay did the position on Thursday, so maybe they're making the same play. Maybe they're forecasting volatility in the future. And if they are, if they are forecasting that, this trade will work out really nicely because you could see as volatility goes up, it'll make the valley of death disappear. And they can hopefully take this trade off for a nice profit. Now, this trade, it doesn't expire for two weeks from now. I would imagine that they probably take it off probably towards the end of this week or maybe at the first of next week. And then the, at that point, they'll probably put on a different trade. And this, this fund's going to be way more exciting to cover. The QQQI, the, the other defiance funds cannot be any more boring. It's just a strategy to capture extrinsic premium. That's all it is. They don't care if the market goes way up, way down. They don't do anything different. It's just so boring to cover. This fund, they've left themselves open for just, uh, just about any type of option trade you can think of. They're able to put on in this fund. So we'll really get a chance to see how good of managers they really are. The other, the other funds have a solid strategy. And they just put the strategy in motion and just follow the strategy. And, and that's fine. And they're just letting math work out. This fund's going to use some math, too. Some math's going to be in their favor also. But, they're, but more than that, they're also going to take, take some actual positions on the market. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to covering this fund. For right now, the spreadsheet that we're tracking it with that I showed you is kind of basic. But it's going to change a lot as they put different strategies in here. I would suspect in the future that they probably do the kind of calendars where they don't buy twice as many as they sell, the, those, the kind of diagonals. Like I say, that's kind of a bold bet when you're expecting volatility. The normal, uh, the normal expectation of traders and of the market, especially of income traders like these guys are, is to expect volatility to collapse and to monetize it that way. So I would expect in the future they do some more typical trades, which would just be a calendar spread. But like I say, no ratio element, just a straight calendar spread. So it would, it would look more like this, where they're trying to go for a range in the middle. They think the market's not going to move too much. That's, that's what I would expect is their more typical trade. And what I would bet they do is they have this trade on, this ratio calendar spread when they're expecting more volatility. And then as their models or whatever they're looking at change, I would imagine they, they go into a more typical, just a regular calendar spread or even just a regular credit spread. We're talking about credit spreads in my options class this week, but credit spreads are a very conservative strategy, similar to writing a, it's very similar to what QQQI does. It's a, it's a positive EV strategy where you have a positive expected math is giving you a positive expected value uh, on both of those strategies. So, so far this video has just brought up more questions than it really has answers. This fund is very young. We have three or four days of, you know, of, uh, of history to look at. We haven't, they, they never paid a dividend. So, you know, who knows on any of this stuff. Um, and I also wanted to mention, I'm using THTA, I'm calling it a, a treasury fund. It's not technically a treasury fund. They do own treasuries. All these funds own treasuries. But actually, THTA sells iron condors or, or credit spreads. They sell an iron condor is just two credit spreads together, uh, out of the money call credit spread and then out of the money put credit spread. But THTA sells deep out of the money call and put credit spreads to... Uh, to earn income, like I say, hit for singles or even bunting. Um, and it's a non-directional trade, but they aren't technically a treasury fund. I just threw them in with this basket on TLTW, which is a treasury fund. And this fund is most definitely a treasury fund because they're both using the actual treasury ETF options, the, the uh, TLT options. So I don't know if THTA should have been in here, but I, I probably caused some confusion on there. But it, we're going to throw it in with uh with these funds um but you know as far as as far as this video usual caveat supply you know do your own due diligence i'm not a financial planner i don't pretend to be um i used to be and i think what i'm saying is true and i'm not trying to gaslight anyone but at the same time uh you know definitely 
uh, take everything with a grain of salt, especially when this fund is this new. Um, you know, if this fund, let's just say this, if these guys keep doing this position they're doing right now, this ratio di double diagonal spread, then this fund would decay. I'm not just going to say that no fund can possibly decay. Well, no, there's lots of funds that can possibly decay. And I'll be the first to tell you if we have a fund that's going to be a decayer. That's, I obsess about this kind of stuff. That's, that's all I do. And as, I, as we watch this over the next couple of weeks and months and get an idea, more of an idea on what their strategy is, I'll be able to make more of an estimation. I think you can tell by looking at the spreadsheet or the prospectus because they're reserving 80% of their money whenever they do credit spreads and they do positive non-decaying type of strategies, but they can only, they limit themselves to 50% when they do a strategy that has the potential for decay. I think they're cognizant of this and they, they aren't, they didn't design a fund that's going to decay, but, but this fund, you know, can be subject to it, you know, especially depending on how much they, how much they do of each type of strategy, but we shall see. Um, so yeah, but usual caveat supply where, of course, I'm excited about this fund because I love funds that use options to limit risk. And that's what I believe these guys are going to do. And that's exactly what the guys on the other defiance funds do and what TLTW does and, and yield max. So yes, I know I'm always excited about option trading funds and that's because I'm just, I love options and stuff. So yes, I'm going to say generically, I like this fund and think it's a good idea, but, and I feel that way about all the funds, but specifically, I don't know. We're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to let some time go by and see how effective their strategy is and, and see what kind of dividend they can pay and, you know, make sure the dividends, you know, if they don't pay a very high dividend and they're subjecting themselves to decay, then I probably won't be so high on this fund, but it, maybe they're paying, maybe they can end up paying a great dividend with this and they subject themselves to little decay. Well, then the trade-off may be worth it. So basically what I'm telling you is I, I don't know. I don't have any idea on this fund. I, I like the general idea of it, but, but I have no idea. And the, the main thing I'm excited about is it's going to be far more fun for me to cover just because it's going to use different option strategies. And that's my favorite thing to talk about. That's why I started that option strategy, the basic option strategy course where I have an outlet where I can talk about option strategies to people that are interested in option strategies. I know this video for being a review video was way in the weeds and I didn't do the best job describing the double diagonal or double calendar or whatever you want to call it. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to try to keep this video under 30 minutes and it's about at 30 minutes now. So apologize that it lasted a little long. Like I say, uh, I really appreciate you guys watching, and I hope you liked it. I'm sure this there'll be lots of questions, and I can't wait to read the questions in the comments. I'm also going to post this video as a premiere, and I'm going to stay on uh, in the comments while it's on and answer questions live. So I'm looking forward to all that. I think this has been fun, and it, you know, and uh, and uh, it'll be even. It's going to probably even get more fun. <laughs> we shall see. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, and you guys have a wonderful day.